Good morning. Today I'd like to talk some more about this concept of orthogonality that we had mentioned previously. There'll probably be at least two, maybe three, of these videos. I'm going to try to make them short, individually. Of course! There are a lot of different coordinate systems you can use, but the ones that we're most familiar with, the ones that seem most natural to us, are the Cartesian coordinates. So we will have two coordinate axes. They'll cross each other at right angles, and they're marked off in some system of measurement, like meters or feet or something. Of course, this isn't the only way that you could do this. You could have picked some other point to call the origin, but then still have this x-axis parallel to that one, and this y-axis parallel to that one. You could do that. You could put the origin someplace else and reposition the directions of the coordinate axes. That would make a perfectly good coordinate system. In what we're going to be looking at today, I'm interested in the situation where I have two coordinate systems like this, and as we'll see later, it does no harm to put them at the same point in terms of where the origin is. And as we'll see later, it does no harm to assume that the origins of the two coordinate systems are in the same place. I'm immediately going to have kind of a naming problem. I can't just write the letter X down because I wouldn't know which coordinate system I was referring to. So I'm going to pick one of the two coordinate systems, keeping in mind one of them is not better than the other, they're just different from each other. And on my paper, I'll draw it the way we usually draw the X and Y axis when we make graphs. These other two coordinate axes form the coordinate axes of a perfectly good coordinate system. I have to give them different names. I'll call them X bar and Y bar. Here's what I want to think about. I'm secretly in the back of my head already thinking about some physics. I'm thinking about Newton's first law. If you give me a point, it has X and Y coordinates. It also has X bar and Y bar coordinates. And I want to think about how those sets of coordinates must be related to each other. Because of the discussion that we had the other day, it's pretty clear that the relationship must be linear. The origin has X and Y both zero, so X bar and Y bar will also be zero. I'm going to use this fact frequently without explicitly referencing it. I'm going to think about the distance from the origin to various points. To start with, I'll stick at the origin. My other point is going to be on the x-axis one unit away. So I don't even need to calculate it. I can tell you that the distance squared from the origin to point P is 1 squared, 1. If I were to use the barred coordinates instead, though, x equal 1, y equal 0 will tell me that x bar must equal a times 1 plus b times 0, a, and y bar must be c times 1 plus d times 0, which is c. The point is the same as it was in the other calculation. The origin hasn't moved. The distance from this point to this point must be 1. The distance squared also must be 1. On the other hand, the BARD system is a perfectly good Cartesian coordinate system, so the distance formula is still on the table. Calculate the square of the distance from the origin to point P, and I find out that a squared plus c squared has to be 1. These coefficients here 
are not completely independent of each other. They're hooked together some way. Do the same kind of thinking, except let the point be r. r is going to have x equals 0 and y equal 1. Calculate the x bar and y bar coordinates, b and d here. b squared plus d squared is the square of the distance from the origin to point r. That's 1. So I have another formula that relates these coefficients in my transformation. I'm also going to think about a point that I'm going to call capital Q. Its x and y coordinates are both equal to 1. Because of the Pythagorean theorem, that means the square of the distance from the origin to Q is equal to 2. As before, I'll figure out what the x-bar and y-bar coordinates of point Q are. Then I'll use the fact that even in the barred system, the origin has coordinates that are 0, and figure out the square of the distance from the origin to point Q in terms of the variables a, b, c, and d. We already just mentioned that that distance squared must be 2, so this is going to give me another equation. At first glance, this looks as though it might be complicated, but the first equation tells me that a squared plus c squared is 1, and also b squared plus d squared is also 1. On the left-hand side of the equation, there's a term 1 plus 1, which is 2. If I subtract that 2 from both sides, this 2 goes away. That term is gone, that one's gone, that one, and that one. And what's left behind is much simpler than it looked at first. It's going to turn out that we have squeezed all the useful information we can by taking particular pairs of points and comparing distances. I've got three equations, and I've got a, b, c, and d, four variables. Typically, when that kind of thing happens, you'll have solutions that have a free parameter in them. So I more or less expect that to happen here. If you look at those first two equations, something obvious suggests itself. In both of them, I have a number, I have another number, and when I square the two numbers and add them up, I get one for an answer. One way that I could represent that would be to think about sines and cosines. A and C might be cosine and sine of some angle. B and D might be sine or cosine of some other angle. And I have that third equation that I have to make happy somehow. It turns out that there's a wide variety of ways you can do this. I'm going to look at one particular one today. Also, it needs mentioning, I don't care if I make A cosine of something and C sine of that something or the other way around. It doesn't make any difference. Also, if I felt like it, I could stick a negative sign on the trig function I could make a equal to the negative of cosine of something. It makes no difference because in this equation I'm going to square the a anyhow. So I'll think of a as being the cosine of some angle alpha. I'll think of c as being sine of that angle. When I think of the second equation, the one that involves b and d, it's not necessarily the same angle, so I have to be careful about that. Also, I'm completely free as to whether I use the cosine in one spot and sine in the other, or backwards. And not only that, as far as those first two equations go, it doesn't matter if I were to flip the sine on the cosine or the sine function. 
So it's easy to make the first two equations happy. What's not so easy is to see that I can make the third one true as well with A, B, C's, and D's that look like this. So if I write down using my angle representation, A times B plus C times D, which we want to be zero, after we put the trig functions in, it's sine alpha cosine beta minus cosine alpha sine beta. And if you remember your trigonometry, you're thinking, wait one minute here. There's a trig identity for that. That's sine of alpha minus beta. I want that to be zero. Now, the sine function is zero whenever you feed in a whole number times pi radians. So there are many ways that I could do that. The easiest one of which, though, is to make alpha and beta the same number. Alpha minus beta is zero times pi, zero. Sine of zero is zero, and that'll make the third equation happy. So we were hoping to get a one-parameter family of relations here, and that's what we got. The alpha is some parameter which describes the relationship between the two coordinate systems, and in terms of alpha, we have our coefficients now. The reason that I'm wanting to look at it like this today is when we look at space-time diagrams and start looking at the Lorentz transformations, something very similar to this is going to happen. If you have any two Cartesian coordinate systems with common origin, then the x-y coordinates of a point and the x-bar y-bar coordinates of that point must be related in this way at least in this class of solutions that we're talking about. Most of you by now have already realized what's going on. The x-bar, y-bar axis has been rotated from the x-y axis by an amount cosine alpha radians. Slipping into matrix language for a moment, if I think about the column vector x bar y bar, it's related to the column vector x y by new coordinate vector is this matrix times old coordinate vector. I'm using c and s as abbreviations for the trig functions so that I don't have to write so much. If I let the two by two matrix q represent c s negative s c, I can make my formula look nicer in this sense. That Q has a very interesting property. It's related to transposes of matrices. If you don't remember, the transpose of a matrix is what you get when you take each row and write it as a corresponding column instead. So the first column of the transpose of Q is C and S, and the second column, vertical column, is negative S, C. So for our particular situation, Q transpose will be this matrix. Pronounce that as Q transpose, or some people like to say Q transposed, but don't say Q raised to the T power, because people will make fun of you. The thing that I want to point out is something very interesting here. If I take Q and multiply it by Q transpose, something interesting happens. If you remember, the way you multiply matrices together is you go across rows and down columns. So to get the number in the first row, first column, I'll go across the first row of the first matrix and down the first column of the second one, multiplying corresponding things and adding them up. C times C 
plus s times s first row, second column, c multiplied by negative s plus s multiplied by c second row, first column, will give me this number, negative s times c plus c times s, and to get the number in the last position, I go across the second row, down the second column, negative s times negative s the negative signs will cancel out. That's just s squared plus c times c. Very interesting. Firstly, negative of sc plus sc is zero, regardless of what alpha is. Likewise, that's zero. C is cosine alpha, S is sine alpha. When you square C, square S, add them together, the trig identity always gives you one back for an answer, regardless of what the alpha is. So to summarize, Q times Q transpose is 1, 0, 0, 1, which, if you know some linear algebra, is the identity matrix. That's the 2x2 two two matrix that plays the role that 1 plays in ordinary multiplication. This says for these kind of things, the way that you undo the Q matrix, the way you find its inverse, is to just take its transpose, which is very easy to do. Generally, if I have a matrix in R n by n, n rows and n columns, so that it's a square matrix, we say that Q is an orthogonal matrix if it has an inverse, and that inverse is just equal to its transpose. If you have such a thing, it's not very hard to figure out that if you multiply Q and Q transpose in either order, you get the identity matrix back. Orthogonal matrices are the ones that relate Cartesian coordinate systems that have a common origin. And as I said, the relevance of this is going to be that something very much like this happens in space-time diagrams in special relativity. I said I was going to try to keep this short, so I'm going to stop there for this video and we will look at some other things related to this in the near future. In the meantime, I hope everybody has a good day, and I'll talk to you again soon.